Um, well, welcome everybody. Um, great day, great week. Warm weather's on its way. Um, we have um, a great program today, like we always do. Before I get started, let me just um, cover a couple of comments and uh, um, notations. Um, I'm Dave Gass, I'm chair of the Business Advocacy Committee. Uh, that's the committee that's responsible for organizing. Is this okay? Can you hear me better? I have to have it. I think I have to have it really close. So all the speakers who have to remember, you have to have it really close. Um, where I'm chair of the business advocacy committee for the chamber, and that committee is responsible for organizing the first Friday forums, as well as some of the other uh, advocacy efforts. One of which is we've been really working intensely on um, the non-attainment status of Sheboygan County. We recently had a meeting with a number of our federal legislators to work on getting that changed, and uh, I think we're really happy with the meeting. It's not going to be an easy process. It's not going to be a quick process, uh, but we're working on it, and we're going to stay working on it. So stay tuned, and we'll give you more information. A um, couple of introductions. Uh, as you know, this last week we had an election, and there were some results in Sheboygan. I'd like to introduce the uh, mayor-elect, uh, for the uh, city of Sheboygan, Mike Vandersteen. Uh, Mike, now that you be mayor, um, there's a bunch of potholes in front of my, uh, so could you get those fixed? So, um, I think also our uh, county administrators here, Adam Payne, are, I thought I saw Adam around. There's Adam back there, okay, great. And, uh, and the county board chairman, uh, Roger Testrodi, is here as well. I th yep, there. And I think we have, oh, I see Jim Bourne, uh, alderman for the city of Sheboygan, is here. Great. Did I miss anybody else? Uh, where is he? Oh, Manny, okay, there you are. Manny from Senator Rod Johnson's office. Thanks. And Catherine Delahunt, our uh, City of Sheboygan Municipal Court Judge. So with that, um, a couple of announcements. Our first Friday forum's coming up. You have sheets at your table, but let me just briefly uh, review those. Uh, um, the first Friday forum in May is Todd Berry. And Todd always gives a very interesting overview of sort of state finances and and um, um, figures and facts and um, add some humor. So um, you'll find that very interesting and we've always had good attendance because he does such a great job. Um, in June, we're going to, going to bring um, the uh, CEOs, the heads of the three secondary education facilities in Sheboygan, institutions in Sheboygan County here to talk about what they're doing to better prepare or better educate our workforce, especially efforts with returning uh, workers. Um, I think you're going to find some of the things that are happening very interesting and in they are working on a number of, uh, of, of, issue, of issues. So um, I encourage you to put that in your calendar. That's going to be a good session. Then we take July off and in August, uh, right now we've got Senator Rod Johnson scheduled to come, come here and we had talked about uh, possibly having T uh, Senator Tammy Baldwin. Uh, so we're still working through those logistics but it's going to be either of those two will be here in and, um, August. And then in September, we've got the secretary and CEO of the Wisconsin Economic Development Corporation, Reed Hall, who will come here and talk about what has been happening and what he's been doing um, um, in the uh, Wisconsin Economic Development Corporation. The next couple of pages um, you'll see is, or the next page you'll see is a number of focal points. And I won't go through each of them, but just Look at those, and I encourage you to, you know, pick up on those. They're more practically oriented kind of sessions. Pick up tidbits of information and knowledge. So um, you'll see there's two of them scheduled there, three of them. So uh, please look at those and, and take those in um, if you uh, have the time. So with that, I think we're going to jump right into our program. What we're going to do today is... Um, I'm going to introduce all of our legislators, and when I introduce them, then they'll give you their committee assignments so you kind of know where, what areas they're going to be working while in this next term of the legislature. And then uh, Senator Lipom and Representative Lemahue are going to give an overview of the budget process, and then we're going to launch right into the questions and answers. Think that you probably have a lot of questions that you're looking for answers, and, and they have the answers. 
So, um, anyway, so let's start with um, um, the. Uh, is Glenn here by chance? Is, I think Senator Grossman joined us, right? Yeah. Yeah. Not yeah. Oh, there's okay. <laughs> <He's by. laughs> um, okay, let me introduce our legislators for um, our county who represent all or parts of our county. Um, Senator Leipom um, represents the 9th district, is that right? Yep. And Senator Grothman represents, uh, Glenn, I forgot what number is your district? 20th. 20th? Okay. And uh, Representative Castell, the 27th. Representative Ensley, Mike Ensley, the 26th, and Representative Dan Lemahue, the 59th. So I actually kind of violated what I said, didn't I? I said I was going to let you all give your committee sites, but maybe what you could do is this, each one of you go and give your committee assignments, and then I'll turn it over to Joe and then Dan to uh, give the budget overview. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I like the fact that Dave tells us the warm weather is on the way. And I, you know, we're going to hold you to that. I'm, uh, I'm Steve Castell. I, I represent the 27th Assembly District, which includes the northern uh, portions of Sheboygan County and then the southern uh, portions of Manitowoc County. I, I serve on a number of committees in the legislature, and, and uh, including the uh, vice, vice Chair of Family Law, uh, a Ways and Means Committee, the um, there's a new committee uh, specifically geared towards urban education, big city education issues, and then another new committee that is uh, has been created to try to to examine the relationship between state and local governments and and look at ways we can improve efficiencies, ways we can improve the relationship, and uh, whatever else we might come up with. Most of my time is spent on education issues because I chair the the education committee that deals with all the K-12 education issues in the state. Although the budget contains an awful lot of those things we might be talking about, um, the, the conversations have, have been winding up. I've been, I've been pulled into them <laughs> one way or another. And what um, the thing that I have been trying to encourage people to do when they consider education policy, because it's always very expensive and it's always very important, is to get away from this idea of the two-year snapshot kind of planning that that the legislature has typically been plagued by because we do two-year budgets, everything's in a two-year cycle, and it's hard to get people to look beyond that. And that's one of the reasons we have made some fairly big mistakes over the years. So what I'm encouraging is for people to get out of that box and to try to do long-term thinking, long-term planning, which is a little uncomfortable because it's not as predictable and it makes you... Uh, it makes you uh, think a little bit harder, but but uh, my my hope is that after we've gone through Act 10 and all that that accomplished, all that it allows us to accomplish in the future, that we we position ourselves in a way to take full advantage of it, so that education winds up actually serving the purpose for which it exists. So with that, I'll uh, I'll wrap up, and uh, we'll save as much time as we can for questions. Good afternoon, everybody. Mike Ensley is my name. I'm the state representative for the 26th district. Uh, the 26th district encompasses about the southern two-thirds of the city of Sheboygan. And then I also have the city of Sheboygan Falls, uh, as well as the towns of Wilson, Holland, Sherman, and Lima. Uh, Random Lake, Cedar Grove, Oostburg, Adel. So a good chunk of Sheboygan County. Um, it is a pleasure to be here. Um, look forward to the questions. Uh, this is one of many opportunities that we have uh, to hear directly from our constituents in a large gathering, so it's very worthwhile for us. And I tr truly do mean it's a pleasure to be here. Madison is a beautiful city, but it's really nice to come back here. <laughs> um, just starting my second term, uh, my committee assignments this year, things were changed up a little bit from, uh, from my first term. Uh, the, in the assembly, we had, uh, or for the most part, in my case anyways, we had, uh, I had three committee assignments. And uh, this year it was six. So we're kind of doubling up on, uh, on the committee assignments. Uh, I am currently the chairman of the Aging and Long-Term Health uh, Committee, uh, which handles things like family care, senior care, 
Uh, it gets involved in Medicare and Medicaid. Uh, there are some things that are going to be tied to Obamacare as well. So uh, that, uh, along with sitting on the Veterans Committee, um, I have a new appreciation for the acronyms that I needed to learn very, very quickly. Um, in addition to that, I also am the Vice Chair of the Small Business Committee. Um, I see some of the tables have some of our flyers on, but I'm just going to put a plug in for one of the initiatives um, that we're starting uh, this term, and that is to uh, review the entire uh, Wisconsin Administrative Code. Um, for all of us, all of you that are in the business community, you, you certainly can appreciate the fact that, uh, that there are a lot of regulations and a lot of rules um, that exist on the books that uh, have a negative impact on the businesses. Um, some of them are just simply old and outdated, and due to technology and things like that, they, they no longer pertain. Uh, some of them are a du duplication of some of the federal requirements. But the bottom line is, um, I think this effort, no matter how long it takes us, um, is going to be a very worthwhile thing for the business community. Um, and I, I, I ask for your assistance in helping us, for all of you uh, that, that uh, are in the business sector, please let us know about some of the issues that affect your daily activities. Because what we're going to do is we're going to take these issues back to Madison, and then they're going to be addressed and reviewed by the various standing committees. Um, so I think this is a very uh, important thing that we need to do, but I also think it's a great opportunity for the business owners um, to start to look at some of, those, some of those hurdles and things that have been put in front of us, um, some of the redundancy, some of the extra paperwork. Uh, that still adds cost uh, to your operation, and in many cases, I believe, doesn't provide any value. So uh, any assistance you can give us on, on any feedback, any comments regarding your business, uh, we would welcome the opportunity to hear uh, from you on that. Lastly, I'll just close with my other committees. I'm also uh, serving on the Veterans Committee, also on tourism, and also on transportation. Thank you much. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Dan Lemuel, State Representative for the 59th Assembly District. Um, that district has the west, all the western townships in Sheboygan County, along with a lot of Washington, Fond du Lac, and a little bit of Calumet counties. Uh, the district basically goes from the city of Hartford in the south end to the village of New Holstein on the north end. So that's a, the long skinny district I have. I used to have uh, about 50% of my district in Sheboygan County with the redistricting. Now I have 50% of my district in Washington County. So uh, now they, they look at me as one of their reps instead of, uh, instead of just a guy that comes from Sheboygan County all the time. Um, for committee assignments, uh, I, along with Senator Grothman and Senator Leibum, are on, on the uh, Joint Finance Committee. Uh, Sheboygan County has uh, good representation on that committee. We, um, but we still need nine votes on the committee to change something. So if you, if you think because we got three votes there that we can automatically uh, uh, do something for this area, we got a good start, but we need nine votes to change anything in the budget <clears throat> on that committee. Uh, the other committee I'm on in the assembly is the um, the review of administrative rules, and uh, as co-chair, I, I co-chair that it's a joint committee, half half Senate, half assembly. Uh, I co-chair that for the assembly, and um, uh, Mike stole a little bit of what I was going to talk about, uh, but he did a good job of explaining what the process is. But on on your table, you do have these cards. Uh, that deal with the project that we're calling Write the Rules. And it's a, it's a project that, that I'm the, uh, the lead person on in the legislature. This is, uh, the, the initial work is being done in the Assembly, not the Senate. Uh, we, have, we have a lot more committees and a lot more people, bodies, to actually work on this than the Senate does because of the, the physical size of the body. But um, uh, we are going to be looking at the administrative code. Uh, there's 1,768 chapters. It's, uh, there's a picture of it on the back side uh, uh, of, that, of that flyer, a picture of the actual code books. Um, this is very boring reading for anybody that's ever looked at this. I mean, if you ever have a hard time getting to sleep at night, go, go on the internet and start looking and reading this stuff and you'll be gone in minutes. We have, as, as Mike said, we have committee chairs that are responsible for anywhere from two or three chapters to 200 plus chapters in this administrative code. 
on their own, they will never find the detail that you're having problems with. They'll never find it. Uh, but those of you that work with this in your business um, or in your industry, whether it's uh, real estate, banking, building, whatever it might be, um, you deal with this all the time. You know where the problems are. So we're going to leave it up to you to tell us as, as legislators where the problems are and we have the ability to deal with it. I won't go into the whole process of how we would make those changes, but we can make those changes. We've abdicated our responsibility as elected officials to the bureaucrats in Madison, as they've done in every other state in the country and, and for sure in the federal government. We've abdicated our responsibility to the, to the bureaucrats. This is an attempt to try to get that responsibility back where it belongs, and that's with the elected officials. There's a website on here that you can go to, and I haven't gone to it lately myself. I, I, I should have before I came here and promised you what's going to be there. <laughs> it, it, this website originates out of my office in Madison, <clears throat> and on that website, you have the ability to interact with, with our office and tell us those specific concerns you have. And then when our office gets those concerns, we have a spreadsheet that shows where every chapter of those 1,768 chapters are, what committees they are. If they've been looked at, if they haven't, that, that's all. You should be able to find a lot of this information on the website yourself. We'll give that concern to that committee chair. They will then have a committee hearing on, on a number of subjects, but that will be something that will be discussed at their committee level. So this is your opportunity to interact with us. Uh, take these home. I've, I've had thousands of these printed up. Uh, if there's any printers in the room, you know that if you order something like this, if you order 10,000, it's going to cost you a certain amount. The next 5,000 is going to cost you like nothing. So we have a lot of these printed. If you need some, contact me. I'll get all you need to hand out to your business group, to your association, to whatever, because we need your input. Without that input, the, pro the project will fail. And, um, uh, and then when, when we have to actually make the changes, we have to let the Senate help us make those changes, and then we send it to the governor. But, uh, but we need your help, and with that, I will pass the mic off to the senators. And, um, and then Senator Leibman and myself will give you a little update on the budget. Hi, uh, I'm Glenn Grothman. I've represented parts of Sheboygan County for about 19 years now. After redistricting, I have the western fringe of the county, uh, town of Scott, Mitchell, Greenbush, Russell, as well as town of Linden and villages of Waldo and Cascade. Um, I uh, am on the Joint Finance Committee with Joe and Dan. I'm also chairman of something called Judiciary and Labor Committee, which is a, a busy committee. And I'm on, uh, what's my other committee? Um, workforce Development, Mining, and something or other. Uh, so, <laughs> something else in the title, I think. Uh, but that's it, and uh, most of our focus right now is going to be uh, on the budget and uh, making sure we look out for the little guy. I want, to, I want to adjust the budget a little bit more to make out for the little guy more than we have right now as proposed. Thanks, guys, and good afternoon, everyone. I'm Joe Lipom. I have the privilege of representing the 9th Senate District. So there are 33 state senators, 99 state reps, and each of us represent, represents a distinct district, as we've shared with you. Uh, the 9th Senate District covers all the area in Sheboygan County that Glenn doesn't uh, represent. So it's most of Sheboygan County, then the entire southern half of Manitowoc County and parts of Calumet County, like Chilton, Hilbert, Potter, uh, that area of Calumet County. Uh, in the legislature this session, I've got a number of different committee responsibilities. I'm the president pro tem, so I'm one of the uh, four leaders of the Senate. Senator Grothman is actually the assistant majority leader in the Senate. He didn't mention that, but two of us from Sheboygan County are part of the uh, majority party leadership team in the Senate, which is helpful to our area. In addition to that leadership, I serve on the Finance Committee with Representative Lemieux and Senator Grothman. I also serve on the Rules Committee with Senator Lem or, excuse me, Representative Lemieux. I uh, serve on the Economic Development and Jobs Committee, the Transportation Committee, Elections Committee, Local Government Committee, Veterans and Military Affairs Committee, and I'm also the Senate representative on the Wisconsin Economic Development Corporation. So you're having Reed Hall uh, join you in a couple months here. Reed is the executive director of WEDC. There's a board of directors for that body, and I was asked to become a member of that board back in November of 2012. In addition uh, to that, I also serve on the Transportation Projects Commission, and Mike Ensley serves on that as well. I don't know if Mike mentioned that, but that's a key 
commission that determines major highway projects and which projects are going to move forward uh, in the state of Wisconsin. And so those of us that are interested in Highway 23 and other highway projects, we have two uh, members of that commission uh, from the Sheboygan County area. We serve in two-year legislative sessions. So the legislature went into office in January, and we began the 13-14 legislative session. And during that session, literally thousands of bills, usually it's about 2,000 bills that will come before us for our consideration. But the biggest bill that we are responsible of taking a look at and then moving through is a state budget bill. And that's really what uh, the legislature is considering at this time. The budget process in the state of Wisconsin is a two-year biennial budget. So the session started in January. The new 13-15 biennial budget is slated to start on July 1st of 2013 and will run through June 30th of 2015. And so before that budget starts, the governor of the state and the legislature have to decide what that budget's going to be. And back on February 20th, Governor Walker introduced his budget proposal now that document came to the legislature, specifically to the Joint Finance Committee. As I think has been said, there are 16 members of the Finance Committee. Um, it's majority party dominated, so there are six Republicans on the Assembly side, two Democrats on the Assembly side, six Republicans on the Senate side, and two Democrats on the Senate side. And we are the first kind of body uh, or committee in the legislature that has uh, a look at the governor's budget. That started with about two weeks of agency briefings. Every state agency that's impacted by the budget comes and spends a lot of time talking to us about the budget and explaining what the budget will do and mean for their state agency. Then yesterday, we began a public hearing process. So we are required by statute to have a public hearing. We're having four public hearings on the, on the bill. Yesterday, we were in Greendale. So Senator Grothman and Representative Lemmyhu and I were were for eight and a half hours yesterday. We got to hear in two minute increments with no stop at all, <laughs> input on the governor's budget. It's an interesting responsibility. Um, we're gonna do that again on Monday up at Lambeau Field. We'd love to have 70,000 people join us uh, on Monday at Lambeau Field. Then we go to the Wisconsin Dells area sometime later next week, I think it is, and we end up in Baldwin, Wisconsin the following week. And each of the sessions are day long. And literally, like yesterday, we started at 10 and two minute, two minute, two minute, two minute until about 6.30 last night, quarter to seven, we had people testifying on the bill. Some of us have local listening sessions as well. So I shared with you on the yellow sheet on your table some local budget input sessions that I'm gonna be hosting. Uh, my colleagues will be joining me when they can. Yesterday we were in Plymouth. I, I started the morning yesterday in Plymouth at seven o'clock and I had about 60 people that came to that input session. So it was a good chance for local folks to share their thoughts with me on the budget. After the public hearings, the Finance Committee begins one by one going through every proposal that's in the governor's budget. And what happens is the Fiscal Bureau, which is a nonpartisan organization, they provide us with detailed papers on every aspect of the governor's budget. And again, we're looking at a budget that the governor is proposing to spend about $68 billion over the next two years, $68 billion. For every penny that's spent, we get a paper that explains kind of the history of the program that it's impacting, um, changes that we might consider, and explanations of what the governor is considering. And then one by one, day after day, the Finance Committee takes up those papers, and we either vote in favor of the governor's position we vote to amend it, we vote to delete it, or we vote to kind of put in our own ideas as to how the budget could be formulated. The budget then becomes a finance document, finance committee budget, and then it makes its way over to the assembly. It will go to the assembly first, and the 99 members of the assembly will have a chance to uh, consider their input on the budget. And then a document comes back over to the Senate, uh, a budget document, and the 33 members of the Senate have a chance to uh, have our, have our uh, input considered. We have to agree, the two houses have to agree on a identical budget and then that budget goes to the governor for his consideration. The governor can approve the budget as brought to him by the legislature or the governor in the state of Wisconsin has a line item veto power uh, here in the state. So he can line item or he could veto the document in its entirety. Our goal and our responsibility is to get all that done before the <coughs> excuse me, middle of June 
so that a document can be uh, to the governor for his signage before the start of the next bi biennium, which again is on July 1st. We think we'll get it done sooner than that, uh, but uh, we'll see how things move along here day by day. Again, the governor proposes to spend about $68 billion uh, over the next two years. That is an increase in spending in the budget that the governor's proposing. In the first year, the budget spending goes up by about 3%. In the second year, spending would go up by about 2.1%. The governor builds his budget off of revenue estimates, and that's one of the challenges. You know, we're always kind of bid building our budget off of estimates as to where the revenue is going to come in. The governor, I think, is conservative, but uh, maybe a, a little bit of a higher end than what I would like to see. His revenue estimate is that we would see a 2.4% increase in revenue in the 13-14 year of the budget and a 3.6% increase in revenue in the second year of the budget. It's on that, then, that he proposes a spending plan, and the governor's spending plan, uh, in most part, is balanced and is structurally sound. There is a tax cut that the governor's proposing, and when we implement tax cuts, that gets counted as spending. And because we would make that tax cut ongoing, there's kind of an ongoing denial of the Treasury that has to be recognized in the next budget. And that is, some people are uh, proposing that as a structural deficit, but it's really based on the governor's proposal to cut taxes from this point forward. But we'll be working through that. We will be looking forward to your questions, but I think the big area, and my colleagues can jump in and share if there's any more, the big areas of the budget that will kind of dominate most of the discussion are education policy and funding, medical assistance, and you know programs in which we as taxpayers invest a lot of money to help out our fellow citizens, and just tax policy. Uh, we've really, I think, dramatically turned things around here in the state of Wisconsin. When we started the 11-13 budget, the budget that we're in right now, it was projected that if the legislature and the new governor didn't do anything, that budget would have a deficit of $3.6 billion, $3.6 billion. We went through the budget two years ago with a lot of bold changes and I think uh, necessary leadership and fiscal responsibility. And instead of having this budget be in a deficit of $3.6 billion, it's estimated that we'll end on June 30th with a surplus of about 400 to 450 million dollars. Uh, so a dramatic turnaround from what we were seeing. That 450 then is a positive cash, you know, balance as we move into the next state budget. And it's from that standpoint that we will build a new budget for the state of Wisconsin. I think overall our goal is to maintain the fiscal stability that the legislature and the governor have developed for the state over the past two years. And within that stable kind of balanced budget perspective, we'll do a lot of good things hopefully for the citizens of the state of Wisconsin. So with that, we want to... Any, any, Glenn or Dan want to throw in anything specific about the budget? Otherwise, we want to just hear your questions and your input because that's kind of where we're at in the budget process. I think, I think one of the things Dave suggested we talk about is where each house stood on the budget. Um, the State Assembly has a uh, uh, 10 vote margin, if you want to call it that. Uh, we need 50 votes to pass a budget. We have 60 Republicans. Uh, we just picked one up in uh, Tuesday's election. Uh, with a vacant seat that, uh, in the Waukesha area, uh, we have 60 Republicans. Uh, the margin is a lot closer in the Senate. They don't have 10 votes to, to play with. Um, right now, my prediction is if we brought that budget, the governor's budget, for a vote in the Assembly and the Senate, it would pass neither house. It wouldn't pass. It would not. It would not pass either house as it's written right now. Um, I think uh, Senator Leibum uh, identified some of the issues. Uh, that people are having heartburn with, uh, people in, in, in our caucuses and in uh, uh, the minority caucuses. Uh, they're having heartburn over school funding uh, with, uh, with a 0% uh, revenue increase. Uh, they're having uh, heart, uh, heartburn over school choice expansion and charter school expansion. Uh, they're having heartburn over the level of bonding, uh, the level of spending that that Senator talked about, the 3% the growth in spending. Um, they're having some heartburn over transportation, uh, the transportation portion of the budget. The Not only the bonding, but the, the, the growth in spending uh, in the transportation portion of the budget. Uh, so those are some areas that, that as you go through the process that the Senator described, um, we have to uh, come to some kind of a compromise on. Uh, there, Without those compromises, uh, we'll be, we won't be passing a budget until September or October. Uh, none of us want that. Uh, so, so we, in the next few weeks, we do have to come up with some compromises. 
Uh, that's where all of you come in as we, as we uh, have those negotiations between uh, Republicans in the Assembly, Republicans in the Senate, between the majority and majority, majority minority parties. Uh, as we have those debates, we need to know that we've got um, people behind us supporting us in our positions as we make those negotiations. So, so that's why it's important to hear from you in all of our offices as we go forward. Um, I was talking to one person before, before the, the meal today, and I said, when I came into the legislature 10 years ago, um, and it's, first of all, it's hard to believe that that was 10 years ago, but when I came into the legislature 10 years ago, I got feedback from, from constituents, and, and I was in a very conservative district, and I'm a, ver a very conservative person. I didn't hear a lot from them. Because they figured, well, we know Lemmy Hill. We know where he's coming, gonna come down on this issue, so why bother calling him and wasting his time listening to our complaints? And he might get sick of hearing from us because he's gonna say, well, what did you think I was gonna do on that issue? You know, and, and I'd maybe be a little offended. And I was a little offended initially when people would call me and say, we just wanna make sure that you're right on this issue. And I said, well, you know, what did you think? But I realized as it went on that the more people that agreed with me that called me, when I was having a debate with another colleague or, or at a committee level, I could go back to all those contacts that I had that supported me and say, hey, overwhelmingly, my district wants me to go this way. And without that support, it makes our arguments a lot harder. And so I think it is important that you, uh, that you contact us. But, but those are some of the issues that, that our caucus uh, and, and Republicans and Democrats alike are having some heartburn on and um, that we'll need some, uh, some compromises on. Uh, there are a lot, of, a lot of little things too, but, but those are the, the biggest issues that for some people will say, I'm, I'm a no on this budget. And uh, nobody, has, nobody has a big enough majority without, without that, so. Is it possible for uh, people to go into question, can you identify like the, the two, three, four sort of major changes, major policy in this budget from the previous years? I mean, is there a two or three? Yeah, well, <laughs> well, the, the major one. Okay. Well, obviously the biggest is, is, is in, uh, in education. The expansion of school choice in charter schools, that, that's, that's a big expansion. Um, and then the funding of, uh, of K-12 education. Uh, how this works is the uh, local governments, like the county board, have a levy limit. And so they're, they're allowed to raise their levy uh, by a certain percentage, or zero, or, or whatever it might be. And Adam's still here yet, so I, I gotta be careful when I say that. Um, but, um, but they have a levy limit on, on, the, on how much they can raise their levy, regardless of what other dollars they get. Schools have a revenue or a spending limit, well, revenue limit, how much they can, can um, take in. And Steve will probably, when he gets the microphone, and say, let me, you screwed up this whole formula on education. But basically, if we give them an extra $100 million statewide into public education, and they're not allowed to spend anymore. What we did is we gave uh, the residents of Wisconsin a hundred million dollar property tax reduction, because if they can only spend so much, and it comes from two places, state or property taxes. Well, there's a little bit of federal government, but very little. From two places, if we give them more, a hundred million more, and they can't spend a dime more, we just give property tax relief to the citizens of Wisconsin. That's what the current budget does, and that's what people are having heartburn over even though we throw money into it. And, and the money, the, direct, the direction is a per, uh, pay for performance, basically, in education. Instead of per pupil, everybody just gets the same amount of increase every time. Uh, it's, a, it's a pay for performance, basically. So it's, it's a different direction in education. That's probably the biggest area. Yeah, and Dan touched on the funding of public education, and I think he laid that out as simplistically as he can. Basically, the governor proposes to invest about $120 million more in our general school aids for public schools, but many school districts are at what's called the revenue cap. And so even though they'll get additional state aid, they don't have the ability to spend that, and it will simply replace tax, property tax levy. And so they're kind of complaining, saying, well, it's nice that you're putting more money into schools, but we really don't have any additional ability to spend it. It will simply give property tax relief to those uh, property owners in our district. 
Uh, the other big education item uh, that Dan mentioned is the governor proposes to uh, expand the school choice voucher program in Wisconsin. So currently, under state law, families in Milwaukee and Racine County that are at certain income levels, lower income levels, if they are unsatisfied with the public school offerings in their school districts, they can receive a voucher from the state, from, from state government, state tax dollars, a voucher of about $5,500 currently. Cur currently, it's about $5,500, and it, the governor puts it up to about sixty five. Okay. Oh, that's right, right. So if they're unsatisfied with their local public school district, they can get a voucher, again, at lower income levels, and then they can use that voucher to go to any voucher school uh, in their area. And the governor proposes to expand that to school districts across the state that have at least 4,000 students and that have at least two underperforming schools per the new school report card system that we uh, 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 all approved and endorsed uh, last year. So every school district receives a report card. If your school district has two underperforming schools and you have at least 4,000 students, families in that district could now be eligible for a voucher and then that voucher could be used to go to any voucher school in your area. And that's an expansion, obviously. Sheboygan School District is over 4,000, and it does have two underperforming schools uh, per the report cards. So the governor's language would trigger vouchers in Sheboygan area school districts. Charter schools, currently schools can authorize charter schools, and charters are kind of outside-the-box ways of teaching. Uh, school districts can authorize them, and in Sheboygan County, Trying to see if Joe's here, but we, I think we have 12 charter schools, for instance, in the Sheboygan Area School District. The governor is proposing more authorizers for charter schools, basically saying technical colleges could authorize schools, the UW could authorize charter schools, private groups could authorize charter schools. So that's, that's an expansion of charter school choice across the state. Medical assistance, I'll give you a quick summary on medical assistance, that's a big part of our budget. Um, billions of dollars, state tax dollars, are spent on medical assistance every year. The governor is trying to um, sustain that program. We made big changes in medical assistance in the last budget, dealing with eligibility levels and requirements. Uh, in this budget, the governor is basically saying that for the first time in the history of the state, we will guarantee that everyone in poverty will be able to receive assistance. Right now, if you're in uh, in poverty, you might end up like on a waiting list or you might not receive assistance. The governor's going to say, if you're at poverty or below, 100% poverty or below, we're going to guarantee that you can get assistance. The change is, is that currently in Wisconsin, we make medical assistance available to people that are at about 200% of the poverty level and below. So the governor's going to say, we're going to guarantee that if you're truly in poverty, which is what medical assistance is supposed to be geared towards, you're going to get assistance. If you're between 100% and 200%, which is our current max, we're going to work to get you onto a private insurance plan and to have private coverage for your health care instead of being on medical assistance, taxpayer subsidized care. I think, again, that's kind of the big easy summary there. <laughs> and then bonding. Uh, the big issue on bonding is, yeah, the governor proposes about a billion, maybe a billion and a half in new bonding. Most of that would go to the transportation fund. Uh, our transportation fund has been rated over the years. Uh, it's underfunded comparison to need uh, when you consider the zoo interchange and the Hone Bridge and projects like Highway 23. So the governor's proposing to bond about an additional billion dollars uh, in the transportation fund area. And his argument, which I think has some merit, is that it's a very inexpensive time to get money. You know, it's cheap to borrow right now. And we've got all these projects that we all want, including Highway 23. It might be best to borrow a little bit more now at the lower rate than waiting another 5, 10 years. We typically bond for highway projects because it's a major capital investment. So it might be smarter to bond more now at the lower rate than to wait years and then pay a higher interest rate. And in tax policy, the governor is proposing an income tax cut. It would equate to about $350 million of denying the state treasury 
and the governor lowers the two middle rates uh, in Wisconsin permanently would reduce the two middle income tax rates. Obviously, everybody would benefit from that. It's geared towards middle class taxpayers, but everybody would benefit because as you are taxed in Wisconsin and your income, you move yourself up on the different uh, tax filings. So everybody would benefit, but it's really geared towards the two middle rates here in the state of Wisconsin. And with that, we want your input and your thoughts in regard to the budget and what we should be focusing on down at the Capitol. Randy. The billion dollars, and this is where we're all digging into this, the, bill, the governor's proposing about a billion in new bonding for highway projects. Um, but there's also a chunk of refinancing of existing bonds that the governor is proposing. And that I think you know, we need to dig into a little bit more. The governor did a little bit of that in the last state budget, and the legislature actually pared that down, the, the amount of refinancing that he was proposing. And I think we'll look at that again. I think the, the bigger new bonding issue is kind of like, is that smart to do it today for roads uh, or do we delay the refinancing? I think we just have to look at, do we really want to keep putting that cost down the road on our, on our children and grandchildren? Um, we've had hearings before, we, we've had some hearings uh, with regard to the department heads and I, I believe the uh, Secretary of Transportation, Mark Gottlieb, who is a good friend of mine, described his budget as a robust budget. I think when the transportation budget came out, I think he would say that new highways and the people who built new highways were winners in this budget. <coughs> Let's see where things end up with the legislature. Terry. My question was actually going back to the school of choice as you know, I've been involved with school choice and supporting it for many, many decades. Right. The, the, the biggest single thing I've heard about the governor's proposal is a shift in the philosophy, the philosophy of school choice away from parental choice and decision making and into the hands of government control. And, and, and I, for one, am absolutely concerned about that a lot, and I know a lot of others who are concerned about that. What, if anything, at this stage can you say about dealing with that set of concerns? I have not called Scott Walker to find out how he really feels, incidentally. Could make that call. That would be good. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm more willing to ask. Right. I know. I know. Um, it, it, boy, this is a big issue. Uh, I think the, the, the challenge that's in front of the legislature right now on choice is that, believe it or not, uh, even after all of the craziness that we went through over the past two years, most legislators support our public school system across the state of Wisconsin and support good quality public education. You know, and, and it's especially true in our area. We've got good school districts that are, you know, in most cases doing real well. But we've also supported the voucher program specifically down in failing areas of the state, like the Milwaukee Public School District and the Racine Public School District. I mean, they have graduation rates that are just inex unexcusable and really had to be dealt with. So what, what the governor is doing is that his proposal takes it beyond that point of kind of working on trouble failing school districts and broadening it to be a much more of a, a parent family choice in regard to education options. And I think the legislature is just, you know, not, I don't want to say struggling, but yeah, I guess we're struggling in a sense as to how do you, how do you make that move and how do you make that expansion? Yeah. Um, uh, I think traditionally school choice means that you get to send your child to a school that is not dictated to too much by a government. And the way the government controls schools more and more in the future is there will be tests that all schools are required to give and will be graded by. And government bureaucrats come up with those tests. Traditionally, uh, traditionally, private schools have not had to deal with those tests. There was a sea change in this budget and that you are absolutely right. Uh, it is apparent that Governor Walker wants these voucher schools to have to give these tests to make sure they're doing okay. The problem with that is that if very liberal people design the tests or just your average education bureaucrat, 
uh, you may wind up requiring that the private schools teach to the test, as they will have to because they are graded by the test, and the private schools may change in their nature, and that's a problem. Uh, some of us up here have signed on to a tax credit instead because with a tax credit, the Department of Revenue is involved, not the Department of Public Instruction, and we will not be requiring private schools to teach to a public school test. And I will point out, I think that voucher program is in for a little bit more of a rocky road than Governor Walker thinks because not every private school is going to be jumping up and down to be regulated by the state of Wisconsin. And you can point, and feel free to call Governor Walker on that. <laughs> this, 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 this is a big issue, Terry. Uh, you know, it, the whole voucher idea, starting with, with Milwaukee, uh, was, was almost a no-brainer because we, almost anything would be better than what MPS was providing. Uh, their success and f uh, failure rate was very poor, and it was very, very expensive. By, by the way the, the MPS voucher program was created, most people don't know this, but every school district outside of Milwaukee within the state of Wisconsin actually got more money <laughs> to spend and ha or, had, or had to levy fewer taxes because we were saving money on that MPS program. The further you move out of Milwaukee, the more that, that whole, that math changes. And uh, it's, not, it's not a reliable uh, thing you can hang your head on anymore that's gonna cost less. And that's one of the things that whatever we do, I wanna make sure that we, we know the answer to that. We need to, we need to run the numbers, we need to have the, the answers. Now on the accountability thing that, that Terry brought up, it's a big deal. Um, you've heard the phrase, be careful what you ask for. Well, along with, the, the, the encouragement or the, the discussion about expanding vouchers, the, the voucher proponents have agreed to greater accountability. When we, we produced the, the, the legislation last session, Senator Olson and I were the chairs of, or the authors of that legislation. And um, at that time, Department of Public Instruction was really pushing for to have their their fingernails in in the voucher schools at that time, we pulled that out of the bill, caught all kinds of heat for it. But the conversation continued, and f to the point where the pressure was building, so the governor went on record saying, "We want we want this uh, accountability legislation before we pass the budget," and the voucher folks from the southeastern part of the state have been saying create a, accountability measures for our schools. Um, not, a, not all of them are in agreement, but that's w where they're at. And unfortunately for me, as the governor in the last interview we did on it happened to mention my name, suggesting that I was going to solve that problem. So what we've been doing is I, I, I told both sides to fight it out and come back with their, with their bottom line proposal. Um, they weren't successful in coming to an agreement, so I told them that we would be making some decisions on their behalf. And uh, uh, I, if, if I were, um, I, I'm not going to make any, any bets on whether or not it becomes law, but it is a good indication of what happens when you get in bed with the government. Eventually, uh, it just evolves this way. It's why I, I tell homeschool parents just stay away from the government. If you don't want the government involved in what you're doing, just try to keep them at arm's length. And um, so that's, that's, it's a big, ugly mess right now that we're trying to find our way through. I understand there's growing concern nationwide about something called the Common Core Curriculum. And I was wondering, and that is a federal mandate that is really aimed at, as I understand it, aimed at uh, controlling behavior of educators on every level and homeschoolers alike, uh, because everything will be geared to a philosophy and a set of tests. I, is that what you were talking about? Uh, and how is that, how, how are, how is the state going to respond to that? I've been dealing with that question a lot, and I think probably we all have to a degree. 
I first started hearing about Common Core three years ago, three and a half years ago. So you, um, the government. Explain it real quickly. For the it's, it's a Common Core standards. So in the discussions that have happened about education uh, results in the United States over the last uh, decades, and as we've seen Wisconsin students or American students um, fail to compete on the, on the global stage as well as we would like them to, uh, one of the th they've come up with a number of suggestions over the years. Up until this point, uh, the curriculum that you find in your schools can vary widely from district to district, school building to school building, it's from state to state. And um, the way they came to those conclusions can vary pretty widely too. It's really not based on any great science. What it's based on is what you know, it really starts in, in, about 150 years ago, you, so a handful of university presidents saying, oh, we think this is what we would like to see. And it evolved from that. It's not, it's, it hasn't been a great process. So the com there were two different um, efforts to create, to put together all the right people and to create a set of minimal standards, not the curriculum, but the standards. And then before I got involved, um, different states were involved in helping to develop that process. Where we are at now is the, the standards being, uh, have been um, introduced to every school in the state. And they're beginning to develop the curriculum. That'll be done on just the way it's always been done by, by the educators within those communities. I've heard some of the, a lot of these, these concerns. So I go back to what is available, what we know about the Common Core Standards, and I, don't, I can't find where the concerns are coming from. And I've asked for specifics that I could dig into it and sink my teeth into it and say this is what they're talking about, and they can never give me that. So there's a lot of this. I understand the apprehension because it's kind of a big deal, but if you, if you really look at where we are now, where we've been, and where we would wind up, if we had a, a, a minimum set of standards uh, in the classroom, it's hard to find something wrong with that part of it. And uh, I, don't, I, don't, I just don't find the devious part of it. I, it just doesn't seem to be there. I, I'd be happy to share whatever information I have available. And if somebody can point, me, point out to me where the problem is, I, I'll dig into it. I'll give you this anecdote just because I love the anecdote because all the education people say they're doing a good job. Um, a while ago, I have a constituent who was a non-traditional student who went to a local technical college to take a class in ethics. The teacher was liberal, but we'll, we'll leave that aside, very extreme. Uh, in the course of the class, they asked the students which country the United States fought in the Revolutionary War. There were nine students in the class, and my friend knew the answer. The other eight students had no clue as to which country we fought in the Revolutionary War. I almost didn't believe my friend, so I took it upon myself to ask people, not the kids going off to Madison or the top 10% in the class, but the people you see hanging out in West Bend or Kewaskum or Sheboygan, working at the local mobile or whatever, which country we fought in the Revolutionary War. I am certain at least 80% do not know. They're not insulted by the question. They consider it like I'm asking some obscure question like, how would you expect me to remember that? It makes me think that maybe we need a common core. On the other hand, <laughs> uh, like Steve says, the common core is not yet out on social studies and our history. Um, I don't trust the people in Washington and at all, and particularly the people dealing with schools of education to decide, you know, I, I don't know what they put in the Common Core, how many slaves George Washington had, or, you know, vital information like that. And uh, so, yeah, it's something we have to watch very carefully, and I, it does not seem to me that we need a national or international test, uh, though when you, I think of this anecdote, the complete inability of schools to apparently put in kids' heads which country fought in the Revolutionary War. Good, nice kids. I'll tell you a funny story. Recently I asked this, to, I, I also asked the, the people in Madison who I run into who are not 
students, sometimes they ask kids to go to Madison, which means the top flight kids. And I, I recently talked to a, you know, the other night a salutatorian at a local high school in Madison, and she did not know who we fought in the Revolutionary War. So it gets out there pretty much. The schools are pretty bad. with the state at a cheaper rate than having to hire 700 more state employees with Wisconsin retirement fund, their health, health insurance, their salary, and the legacy costs of these people. I just don't understand where the governor is coming from in this. Yeah, that's again a Department of Transportation issue. Specifically, the governor and the administration are proposing to hire an additional 160, 180 new engineers. They would be state employee engineers within the Department of Transportation. <clears throat> The total number, though, is about 700 new employees. Other areas that the governor puts new people into, a lot of uh, areas in the Department of Revenue to track down delinquent taxes and uh, individuals that are not uh, up to date on their taxes. They say uh, the Department of Secretary, Secretary Chandler was in, and he said that that's uh, uh, actually a positive uh, proposal. They'll bring more money in than what it'll cost. The governor puts more people into fraud and waste in our Medicaid programs. But the big area is the 180 for the uh, Department of Transportation. We questioned that specifically in the Finance Committee, and we're asking for more information. Just yesterday, I contacted the Secretary's office, and I want him to provide to me the specific uh, analysis or study that they did to show that we would be better off hiring you know, new state employees, considering all the legacy costs than what we're currently getting in contract. Uh, they've been a little bit slow in wanting to release that information, but I think before the Finance Committee uh, does anything on that, we'd want to have that, you know, uh, certain documentation to allow us to look at whether or not that's really the case. The Secretary is also saying that he needs to have a balance between private contractors and in-house uh, engineers to kind of keep each other in line, and he thinks that this is the right balance uh, for uh, the State Department of Transportation. But I can tell you that there's a a large degree of hesitancy on that on that proposal by the Department of Transportation. Oh, just my two major things that I want to change in the budget. What are those? Um, the university did very well in this budget. They're getting a six percent up for each of the two years, and I don't think that's necessary. But he's also saying there's no cap on what the regents can charge for tuition. Now, the regents are assuring us tuition will not go up too much. Um, and maybe they will, will abide by that. But a scandal in our country is the degree to which young people are so hugely in debt. I mean, what do you do if you're a 23-year-old kid who's got a degree in communication arts or something and are sitting there 50000 in debt, which is not uncommon? Or you're a young couple who are both 27 years old and you have 100 grand in debt. Uh, I know it's something that the well-paid administrators of the UW system want. I think it is not right that we should be raising tuition again. And uh, I would not. And I will tell you, as we speak, unless there was a huge upset, this morning the UW Regents hired a new chancellor for Madison, and that new chancellor that the Regents hired, I was looking up on stuff she said. She's a former economics professor specializing in poverty. First of all, she said that we ought to be charging more tuition for parents who make more money. That's what we're just getting in Madison. That's what these genius regents are hiring for us. The second thing she's saying is we ought to charge more tuition if you're getting a business degree. And I think business degrees right now are overrated, but I, I think what she meant is we should be charging more tuition if you're majoring in something practical. Okay. Th that <laughs> so when I say I look out for the little guy, I, I think we've got to be looking out for the students more and the administrators not so much. And the other thing, there's a thing in the budget I hate. And I, I, I try to be kind of less government, but right now in the state we're one of a few states that don't have what they call a robust rent-to-own industry. Uh, rent-to-own is where maybe you go to a, a store and you, you rent a TV for 30 bucks a week and after... 70 weeks, you've got it. 
after running it for 30 bucks a week. And maybe that TV is worth 500 bucks and you've paid 2100 bucks for it, now it's yours. In other words, they take advantage of not too mathematically bright, overly materialistic people. We've kept them out of Wisconsin so far, and uh, I don't see any reason. When Governor Doyle was here, we didn't like it when he put policy in the budget. And I don't like putting policy in the budget either, uh, and particularly policy to help people like that. And I don't like that Governor Walker put that in the budget, and I want to get it out. stuff like that where everybody was throwing darts at Governor Doyle in the past and it's like, you know, here we, we elected this guy and I voted for him. It's like, yeah, all right. And then he does the same crap that we have, you know, we've chastised others for in the past. So, Senator Grossman, as long as you have the microphone. Well, uh, I think uh, next week uh, the director of the Fiscal Bureau that Joe mentioned will, will put out items that are not fiscally related. And uh, I hope the legislature takes those things out, because you're absolutely right. We made fun of Governor Doyle for putting things in the budget that didn't belong in the budget. And usually when those things are in the budget that don't belong in the budget, it's there for a reason. On the Joint Finance Committee, as Joe said, you know, this thing is so long, there's no way you can familiarize yourself with it. And you put another smelly little article on there, you're not getting any testimony about that. You have no idea what you're voting on. If you have a separate committee... They can focus on that bill. They can look at the nuances and make sure it's done right. And I hope uh, we stick with uh, where we were under Governor Doyle and say keep that stuff out of the budget. Yeah, and that will play out next week, as the Senator mentioned. The Fiscal Bureau develops a paper that says from our fiscal evaluation, we think these items are more policy than fiscal-oriented. And typically the legislature kicks those things out. But every once in a while, you know, if you like the policy, it stays in. If you don't like the policy, it gets kicked out. That game's played a little bit as well. So we'll see where things go next week. Yes, Fred. Everybody hear the question? The, the, the question is, is on the Write the Rules project, which, which I mentioned before, and you have a card on your table. Uh, the question is, are we just uh, tweaking it a little bit, but not really going after the stuff that needs to be taken out, basically? Okay, we've, we've looked at, at approximately 90 chapters of the 1,768. Some of those chapters will be suspended in their entirety. Some will be modified. Um, we have started the process, to be real honest with you, with some cats and dogs, as we call them. The low-hanging fruit, whatever. Stuff that's obsolete, stuff that's, that's um, um, hasn't been used anyway, so just get it out of the code, okay? That's the easy stuff. That's not gonna help the business people around in, in this room, around these tables. We do have intentions. But what we wanted to do was establish some credibility to the process. Because as soon as we start saying we're going to go look at the administrative code, everybody says, dirty air, dirty water, consumer protection out the door. That's not our intent. Our intent is to make it business friendly and user friendly. We have, we have an accountant, a CPA caucus in the assembly. They actually have their own caucus. And that sometimes is what takes us longer to do business. Right, Randy? Okay. But they intend to take the administrative code dealing with CPAs and dealing with the whole code that deals with the work they do for businesses and rewriting it. Uh, it'll always be there, but they're going to rewrite it. CPA, CPAs are going to rewrite it, and, and it's, it's going to be much friendlier to businesses. Um, so we have sections like that, the, the builders, uh, WMC, They've got some, some serious changes that they want to make in, in environmental regulations that, that you're burdened with and things like that. We didn't, if we would have started with one of those right out the shoot, uh, we would have been criticized by every media in the state of Wisconsin, all the tree huggers, all the environmentalists. They would have killed the whole project. We'll get there. 1,768 chapters, we're not going to get there in two years. It's going to take a while. Sometimes a chapter takes 10 years to rewrite one chapter. 
or one part of a chapter. So it's going to take time, that's, but that's why we need your input. And that's why when we get to the, the, get rid of the cats and dogs and get to the meat and potatoes, then, then you'll see some change. But, but we, we have to establish some credibility first. And, and when they start coming after us, we can say, hey, we looked at all these. And 60 of those chapters, they're good to go. They're working. They're doing what they're supposed to do. But we want to, we want to create some credibility first. Maybe can I end on what maybe is an easy question? What is Highway 23 to be building? <laughs> 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 Let me let me just uh, let me just reiterate the whole rules issue, and that that is an awesome undertaking that the legislature is uh, participating in right now. Uh, there are so many aspects of your life as business people, as citizens, that are controlled by rules that were enacted by an unelected bureaucracy, and the legislature of today is trying to you know restore, as the representative said earlier some of that accountability and have the legislature actually look through these things. I mean, rules that impact your private property rights, how you can use your property adjoining a state highway down to, you know, how many pesticide signs Adam and Guy have to put out here on the golf course to let you know that they spray their lawn. I mean, all those things are in state rules and code, and uh, we want to look at all those and make those uh, more common sense and more friendly for just living in the state of Wisconsin. Highway 23, Highway 23 is fully funded in the budget. The expansion of 23 from Plymouth to Fond du Lac, fully funded in the budget. The department is moving forward with the acquisition of land, with the uh, development of easements and things like that. But there is a lawsuit pe pending in federal court, a group of anti-road development people that have one property owner that lives along, or has property along Highway 23, but lives in Milwaukee. They have filed suit against the project, and it's pending in federal court. And so the Department of Transportation, while the money is in place, the Department of Transportation is saying, you know what, until that federal lawsuit is resolved, we can't start anything. It was supposed to start in the fall of 2012 and be completed by 15. Now they're saying it might be, someone just got an update yesterday. I don't know who got the update, but uh, they're saying it should be 14, 15, into 16. Right. It's fluid? Yeah. We're pushing it as best we can, but we can't stop or intervene the federal lawsuit now. And to be honest, this group does this across the nation. They don't like road expansions, so they go in state by state. They find one sympathetic property owner, and then they do basically class action lawsuits against road development across the United States of America. Let me just give you two quick things on the budget. Two kind of unknowns out there that we'll have to contemplate over the next couple of weeks and months is uh, we get new revenue estimates. As I mentioned, the budget's built off of estimates of revenue over the next two years. In May, early May, we should get an updated revenue estimate, and that will tell us, hey, either the governor's budget's on track with revenue estimates, or maybe there's a positive or a negative that we have to deal with. So that will uh, change things out uh, potentially dramatically. I think in the last budget, we had a $400 million upper estimate right before the legislature finalized uh, their work on the budget. But then the other big unknown is the federal uh, dollars that we receive. The current state budget has about 29% of all our revenue comes from the federal government. And if you haven't noticed, the federal government's kind of in a mess. Um, you know, they haven't passed a budget in over four years now. And so there's no certainty as to whether or not, you know, the billions of dollars of Medicaid money that we rely on in this budget are going to come from the federal government, the transportation funding that we get from the federal government, if, th if that's going to materialize, there's a lot of uncertainty in regard to federal funds. And that's 29% of our revenue stream. And that will go up and down over the next couple of weeks as they continue to play around in Washington with sequesters and, you know, budget uh, ongoing resolutions and things like that. So a little bit of unknown in regard to that that we'll have to struggle and deal with over the next couple of months. Thanks. Well, I, once again, I want to thank, we want to thank uh, our representatives, uh, senators, for uh, participating in this session today. We've said it in the past, but it, it should be said again because it's true. Um, I think we have, we think we have the best set of representatives of any county in, in Wisconsin. Thank you. Okay, with that, if anybody has any other questions, uh, we'll uh, adjourn for today, and we look forward to seeing you on May 3rd.